This is a Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. Today is Wednesday, June 12th, and my name is Nathaniel Whitejoyle. Today, we are joined by Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson and President Maggie Gunderson, and they're going to catch us up with the developments in nuclear power over the past two weeks. Thank you both for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's nice to be home. Arnie, where have you been? I haven't seen you in two weeks. Uh, yeah, with the exception of one Saturday, I haven't been here. I was in, uh, I was in Canada two weeks ago testifying in front of their uh, CNSC. That stands for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And uh, that's like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here. Um, about the Pickering units that are up on the lake near uh, near Toronto, and uh, that was a fascinating experience. The um, uh, it's entirely unlike the American hearings because in the American hearings they uh, uh, they don't talk to you. Um, and as a matter of fact, the uh, last time I testified to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the uh, uh, the head of the panel I was testing for to not only did he not talk to me, but he fell asleep. Uh, these guys are active and involved, and they ask you questions, um, which was uh, an exciting an exciting difference. Well, and what happened? I mean, when they asked you, what was the setup like? How many people were on the panel? What did it look like? How many people did were on sitting next to you helping you testify? Was it a long hearing? Well, I testified for about half an hour, and um, it was me at a desk. And on the right side of me were, uh, oh, must have been 15 people representing the, uh, the staff of the regulator. And on the left side of me were 15 or 20 people representing the uh, people that owned the power plant. And in front of me were the uh, nine commissioners, all of which are appointed by pro-nuclear forces. So I felt a little bit uh, surrounded at the meeting. You couldn't even have... One of the interveners who had retained you sitting with you? No, it was my report, and uh, they wanted to hear from me. And uh, it was, uh, it was a, a, like I said, an exciting dialogue. They, they seemed to, um, to want to uh, know a little bit about what I had to say. The Pickering Unit is really near Toronto, uh, nothing like it in the United States. It's only uh, um, 30 kilometers from the edge of Toronto, about 20 miles from the edge of Toronto. And Toronto is... Uh, fourth biggest city in the, on the continent with, with four or five million people. So they built six nuclear plants within uh, you know, 20 or 30 miles of the biggest uh, city in Canada and one of the biggest cities in, on the continent. So there, there's, there are six nuclear plants that close to a major city with that many people? Well, the good news is there's actually eight, but they shut two down. How, what type of containment system do they have? They admitted on testimony that their containment was not as good as Fukushima Daiichi. Um, I think that was the, uh, the, the highlight from the other side. They, they acknowledged that uh, if a Fukushima Daiichi accident happened in, uh, um, at Pickering, the containment is not as good, and that um, um, you can have a failure that would result in a, uh, a serious release of radiation to the city of Toronto. Now, they get around that problem by assuming the accident that causes it doesn't happen. So if you assume the accident can't happen, you don't have to worry about the containment. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I mean, that's as frightening as thinking, you know, that about what happened with the plants blowing up in Daiichi, that there was never going to be a tsunami there. They didn't have to think about it. So don't protect the uh, cooling source for the nuclear plants, and it won't happen. It's like, uh, I think we had a podcast up a while ago where we had an ostrich with its head in the sand um, because people just don't want to know what's happening. I think that was a, about uh, the San Onofre plant, wasn't that, the ostrich in the sand? Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, the sand that the ostrich had its head in was right by San Onofre. Didn't you present about the San Onofre plant while you were out in California last week? Yeah, I... I Came back from Canada, washed my clothes, and turned around and hopped on a plane out to California. Um, and the topic there was San Onofre. And uh, frequent visitors to the site will know we've been talking about San Onofre now since March of last year when uh, the steam generator sprung a leak. 
And we did a big video in April of last year about the steam generator spring in a leak. Well, we've got Fairwinds Associates, which is the um, expert witness firm that I own, and, and you're one of the expert witnesses with. Uh, that firm has done five major reports on San Onofre, and you did testimony in front of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. You were out there for an international symposium, correct? I went out there um, to be a speaker at a symposium, um, three hours with uh, international speakers, including the former Prime Minister of Japan, Khan, uh, former NRC Chairman Yasko, and uh, former NRC Commissioner Peter Bradford. So the four of us spoke for three hours about the weaknesses in the regulatory system and how uh, Southern California was uh, just as much in jeopardy as uh, Fukushima Daiichi. I have met Peter Bradford a number of times in our work here in Vermont, and, and he's one of my heroes because he's one of only two NRC commissioners, uh, Peter Bradford and Victor Galinsky, who did not go to work for the nuclear industry after finishing their time on, on the commission. Peter Bradford was on the commission when Three Mile Island had its accident, and he's been very clear about some of the errors that were made, and I, I really commend him for stepping up to the plate and talking about that. Yeah, there's a link to um, the Prime Minister's Khan video, um, the, a, a link to ch former Chairman Yasko's video, uh, and a link to, uh, um, you know, Peter Bradford's video on the on the site, as well as as my speech, and uh, they they wove together very well. Uh, there were about 15 cameras there, and maybe 10 other press, plus a couple hundred people from Southern California. The room was full, and uh, um, we spoke from all of our different angles. I mean, we had a politician, two regulators, and a, and a former industry senior VP, me. Uh, and we all talked about the uh, the fact that the system under which nuclear is regulated is fundamentally bankrupt. Could you explain a little bit more specifically what you mean by fundamentally bankrupt? Are there any examples you can give us? Yeah, the the nuclear regulators spend so much time with the people they're regulating that uh, we call it the echo chamber effect. And uh, I wrote about that for Greenpeace um, earlier this year. In a, uh, uh, in a major report, and it's called the echo chamber effect. But basically, if you put a bunch of experts in a room and they talk to each other long enough, all they hear is each other's echoes. And uh, that's what happens with nuclear. You get the nuclear regulator and the people that own these nuclear power plants in a room. And as long as there's no outsiders like me or Dave Lockbaum from Union of Concerned Scientists or others, um, they, they agree on a story that's plausible to them but they really don't think about the, uh, um, the, the worst case. They don't expect the unexpected. With that kind of short-sighted thinking, is it likely that we will see an accident at one of these aging facilities such as Pickering or San Onofre? Well, the, the good news is um, uh, for Americans is that we, we would not build Pickering in the United States. It's got some design flaws that uh, the Americans don't accept. Um, and the good news for Californians is that three days after I spoke with Prime Minister Khan and Yasko and Bradford, um, the utility decided to shut San Onofre down forever. So um, neither San Onofre 2 or 3 is a threat to the public health and welfare anymore because they'll never start back up. Isn't it true um, that the reasons Edison said it shut San Onofre down was the uncertainty of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board decision, and isn't that due in a large part to the work that we did at Fairwinds? Yeah, the the Friends of the Earth hired a uh, uh, an attorney to uh, uh, petition the NRC to uh, ask for public participation in the process, and that was almost a year ago, and the NRC. Uh, they said, well, we don't know if the public has a right to participate or not. And they formed this thing called an Atomic Safety and Licensing Board to evaluate whether or not the public had a right to a, a public hearing. Now, the ASLB, as it's called, the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, is an adjudicatory panel, that, and they make a judge finding. 
am I correct? Yeah, there's three judges, and uh, so it's a three-judge tribunal. And uh, what happened is after some testimony uh, provided by experts from Friends of the Earth, including us, and uh, then oral arguments by the attorney that Friends of the Earth hired, the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board shocked the industry and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by saying the public's entitled to a public hearing. Um, it sounds obvious to the rest of us, but it certainly was a shock to uh, both Edison and to the NRC um, that uh, public involvement is expected. When you say it's a shock to the NRC, it's a shock to their staff. Um, that was siding with Edison, that Edison could move ahead. Yeah, it was pretty clear for the last 16 months that uh, the vast majority of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff um, wanted Edison to, to uh, move ahead, even though they, uh, they, they didn't tell the truth about like for like. And, and, and Can you explain a little bit more about that incident with Edison? What does like for like mean? Yeah, uh, there was um, Fairwinds caught the fact that the original steam generators weren't at all like the replacement steam generators, and um, yet Edison said they were like for like. Senator Barbara Boxer released a letter about three weeks ago, and and in it it was an Edison letter written in 2004 that said that the original and the replacement generators were not like for like. Um, and that there were potentially dangerous vibrations that could be occurring. So Edison has known about potentially dangerous vibrations since 2004, but portrayed to the NRC and to the Public Service Commission in, uh, um, in California that they had um, the utmost confidence that these generators were going to work. Now, we call that prudence in the, in the, in the expert witness testimony um, field. Um, if if a company makes a decision that's not foreseeable, they get their money back because it's a prudent decision. But in this case, the Edison decision to build these generators was imprudent, and they knew it. So uh, there's billions of dollars at stake here that shouldn't be paid for by the people of California. This was an imprudent decision by Edison, and it should definitely... Um, not be carried by the by the ratepayers, but rather it should be carried by the stockholders. It's the, it's their mistake and the people of California. They're asking the people of California not only to pay for this, but to put their own public safety at risk. Is that right? That is right. That's what Edison did. The ratepayers have already paid 1.3 billion dollars in extra charges and for damaged um, equipment these tubes that were leaking and were improperly designed by Edison and Edison kept lying to regulators, lying to the NRC, viciously attacking us for our reports, lying to the Public Service Commission that, oh, they didn't know about this until a whistleblower brought forward these documents and gave them to Senator Boxer. And um, my hat's off, a hat tip to that whistleblower who had the courage to do that. You know, it's... Um the, the new generators are cost $800 million. And um, um, then the outage that went on for 18 months cost $500 million. Plus, every month that the plant was shut down, the people of California paid another $60 million every month for 16 months. So that's another $750 million to pay for the salaries of the 2,000 people that weren't generating any electricity. So the whole bill to the state of California is something north of, of $2 billion. What kind of responsibility is Edison Electric taking? None. They're blaming everybody except Edison Electric. Their press release said that the, uh, the NRC process is wrong, and then their press release blamed the people that built the steam generator, Mitsubishi, but they never admitted any of the problem fell back on, on them. That this was a self-inflicted wound, and I think Edison's refusing to admit that. It's really clear. I mean, when you look, especially with, we had outlined that in our report, what the regulation requires a utility or an energy company to do when it makes a change to a 
piece of safety related equipment and what it has to do. And Edison did not do that. They claimed that it was an oversight. They claimed they didn't know, but this two, 2004 memo proves they knew and they did it willfully. Uh, it's so Senator Boxer had also has also asked for a Department of Justice investigation and you know personally I think there should be criminal prosecution I mean they put the lives of eight and a half million people at risk who are in close proximity to that plant the, the term is called a materially false statement and when you tell a regulator something that's wrong and you know it that's called a materially false statement. And they were doing that. When I took the stand uh, back in uh, January, four days before I took the stand, they sent a letter in trying to uh, attack my upcoming testimony. And they said repeatedly they had no knowledge that these steam generators were going to have problems. Well, you know, Senator Boxer's letter shows that uh, they made a materially false statement. And that's a really big lie, basically. Um, and that requires um, uh, investigation by, by the federal police. And I hope that there's an investigation ongoing because, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the letter that preceded my testimony back in January was loaded with materially false statements. Does this speak to a larger issue? These power plants are supposed to be self-reporting, and yet they're also supposed to be profitable. Do they have the responsibilities to the ratepayers or to their stockholders? Yeah, the NRC's entire structure is that they count on these people admitting when they break the speed limit. And um, I don't know how many people drive over to the police station and turn themselves in when they've bro broken the speed limit. I can assure you that <laughs> nuclear utilities don't do it either. And that's exactly what happened uh, at, at Edison. You know, they, they broke the speed limit. They... Um, they broke the speed of sound as far as that goes. They, they, their damage uh, um, was predictable. They knew it, and yet they hid um, and, and chose not to tell that to the, to the regulator. Now that the plan has been shut down, what is the next step to make sure that the people of California are not negatively impacted? The next step is the decommissioning and the dismantlement. Um, and my concern, the industry is trying to do a thing they call safe store. Maggie, what is safe store? I think it's a euphemism for lazy store. It's passing the buck and the safety factors to another generation, two generations down. I mean, it would be, mean the plant would be mothballed for 60 years and sit there. This carcass would be lying on the shores of the Pacific Ocean on the San Onofre Beach and at risk to any kind of um, at risk to any kind of earthquake or seismic event and it would just be sitting there with all of its buildings intact and mothballed in, in um, concrete and they would expect then 60 years later to take it apart. And I think that's just a horrendous legacy. We've seen some of the, the plants that are mothballed like that are already leaking. There's been near misses with, with fuel pools. I think Arnie can speak to that better than I can. You know, if the people of California push Edison, um, this thing could be turned back into the beautiful beach it used to be in about 10 years. Um, they can be uh, completely decommissioned and turned into um, you know, beautiful sand and the, and the beach it was, with one exception, and that's the spent nuclear fuel. The spent nuclear fuel is um, in the reactor right now, but quickly will come out of the reactor and go into the spent fuel pool. Um, it has to stay in the spent fuel pool for about five years until it cools down enough, but then it can be put in dry casks to be stored outside in air. Um, so eventually, say 10 years out, there'll be a parking lot full of these huge cylinders loaded with radioactive spent fuel. There's enough cesium in those spent fuel containers that it equals 700 nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, All of the weapons that went off in the atmosphere over the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, all that radiation that's thrown up is in the fuel that's on the San Onofre site. So it's important to protect that piece of it, but the rest of the site and all those big buildings there can be 
dismantled completely and turned into the beach it used to be. Who's going to pay for that? Well, they got $2.6 billion already set aside, and that should be more than enough. Uh, the, the, um, the decommissioning studies show it's around a billion dollars a nuclear reactor. So I, I think there's enough money set aside to, uh, to completely decommission the plant. What could go wrong with the cleanup effort at San Onofre? Are there any unforeseen costs? Can you talk about other complications you've seen with similar power plants as they have been decommissioned? Some, some plants, when they uh, are decommissioned, discover that pipes and pumps and things like that have been leaking for 40 years. At Connecticut Yankee, they found that a tank had been leaking for about 30 years when it was decommissioned and had uh, put down um, radioactive strontium uh, into the groundwater. Uh, and that added about a billion dollars to the cost of the cleanup. So if all goes well, there's enough money to, to completely decommission the plant quickly. But you want to do it now because if it's leaking, that, that you don't want to give that leak a head start. And it's important to do it soon so the leak doesn't have a chance to spread out. If there is a leak, and if there isn't, that's great. You get your beach back in 10 years. What can we do to make sure that this cleanup effort is done in the right way, in the best interest of public safety? Yeah, I think the, um, the the public deserves someone on the on the cleanup committee to make sure that this plant is safely decommissioned. You know, right now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will say, hey, that's our responsibility, the public has no rights. These are the same people that miss the fact that the steam generator was falling apart. Um, so uh, I, I think it would be a great idea if the people in California demanded a seat at the table and said, hey, we want to be part of this decommissioning with the goal of uh, getting our beach back so we can surf and enjoy the, uh, uh, the outdoors. And that we want to be sure that the plant is decommissioned and dismantled without leaving a carcass in, in Lazy Store for 60 years. Yeah, there can be an awful lot of um, um, misspent money unless someone's really watching the, um, uh, the piggy bank. And I think uh, Edison is not going to watch the piggy bank very well. So I think that, yeah, it would be an awfully important to, um, uh, to have public involvement to make sure the money's not being misspent, that leaks, if there are any, have, have been detected and been isolated, and that the process moves along just as fast as possible. Edison right now is saying decades. I can't understand that. They've got $2.6 billion set aside. That should be enough to decommission this plant. Arnie... What are the national ramifications for what happened at San Onofre and uh, the like for like and the 50.59 process and how the regula regulator oversees a utility getting relicensed? The, the shutdown at San Onofre has national ramifications. It's a seismic event for the nuclear industry. The um, um, the industry lost four nuclear plants in the last f six months, and uh, we're doing just fine without them. And uh, I think the public understands now that uh, uh, nuclear plants are not necessarily clean, safe, or reliable. Uh, there's a couple more plants on the rope. But nationally, the other big issue is this like-for-like, like, or 50-59 in, in, in law. Um, and, and actually, the davis Bessie plant out uh, near Toledo is the leader of the pack there. They have a hearing coming up on a steam generator modification. Based on what the public's learned at San Onofre, um, the, the public is demanding a, a hearing before this generator is fixed as opposed to wait for it to break afterward. Thank you for catching us up on the permanent closing of the San Onofre nuclear plant and on the continuing struggle to deal with the aging Pickering nuclear plant in Toronto. In closing, I would like to ask if either of you have any other issues that should be discussed during this podcast. We mentioned a couple times that American scientists in Japan have really questioned the data that the Japanese are, are presenting. A noted author, Art Keller, who's published several books and writes for a lot of different magazines, uh, did a story in a full interview on this team that, that went to Japan and did radiological testing. And uh, it's very chilling to read his report, and that will be on our blog on Thursday. So I hope everyone reads.
I would like to close by thanking both of you for being here today. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to be home. This has been a Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. <laughs>